have a Bible, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, as we prepare to present the Word of God today on Israel and God's place for Israel in prophecy. I thank you, Pastor Rogers, for that gracious introduction. I'm highly honored to stand in the pulpit of one of Florida's greatest spiritual leaders. Those of you who are privileged to call them your pastors are blessed and highly favored of God. These two wonderful people deserve your prayers, your love, your loyalty, and your support as our nation stumbles in the darkest hour of our history. Pastor Rogers is a gifted leader for Christians United for Israel. Christians United for Israel is now a national grassroots organization that has more than 10 million members who stand boldly with Israel unashamedly. <clears throat> Pray that the unlimited blessings of God rest upon Pastor Enrito and this wonderful congregation of dedicated people for the cause of Christ. Our topic tonight is Bible prophecy. Our title is <clears throat> Israel, God's Prophetic Clock. Read with me 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. Ready? And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Emphasize, so we have a prophetic word confirmed which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Yes. Father God, we gather in this house of God tonight and we live in a nation that's stumbling in moral and spiritual darkness. And the prophetic word is a light that guarantees that God is in absolute control. So today we bring the word of God that men and women in this room may be blessed, may be encouraged, and those who are not ready to meet the Lord in the air will be before they go home tonight. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said amen. amen. You may be seated. So the question is asked, approximately, why study Bible prophecy? First, approximately one-fourth of the Bible was prophecy when it was written. If God the Holy Spirit took the time to write one fourth of the Bible as prophecy, it certainly behooves every believer to study it and to know more exactly about what God has planned for our future. Secondly, we should study prophecy because the Word of God declares Bible prophecy to be absolutely accurate. That's one of the complaints I hear from church to church. How do you know that it's absolutely accurate? The text confirms the absolute accuracy of Bible prophecy. We have a more sure word of, of prophecy. More sure than what? Peter states, we, the disciples, were eyewitnesses of his majesty, that would be Jesus, following the resurrection. We saw him come out of the grave. In a court of law, an eyewitness account is the highest standard of accuracy possible. St. Peter records three verses earlier in 116 that he and the disciples, quote, have not followed cunningly devised fables concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, we were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. It's a certainty. Peter makes a bold statement that forever removes the doubt from the mind of the believer concerning the accuracy of prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy, which is greater accuracy than an eyewitness account. You can't get it any closer than that. Peter confirms saying, the prophetic word is a light that shines in a dark place. 
A dark place is a place you cannot clearly see the future. No one can clearly see the future of the United States of America. Our nation is stumbling in a moral and spiritual darkness like never in our history. Never in the history of this nation have we had such absolute immoral corruption in our government combined with pathetic and incompetent leadership. Never have we had roving gangs of anarchists running and burning down cities. Policemen are mocked and ridiculed. They're shot dead in the streets. Never has the public school system abandoned the Ten Commandments while the Socialist Teachers Union forces upon our small children the madness of becoming a transsexual person. Let's cross this bridge as a nation. When you were born, you were either born a boy or a girl. That's God's plan for civilization. Anything other than that is demonic madness. It's absolute witchcraft. It's not brilliance, it's stupidity on steroids. Never have we had a president and his son who were under the influence of a foreign country committed to America's destruction. Our forefathers called this treason. I don't believe any politician can save America. There must be a return to righteousness in this nation if we are going to survive. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. The Bible says righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The Bible says let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Saints of God, our nation is in a dark place. Let us turn to Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. There is no other answer. There is no other answer. He is the shepherd of the sheep. He is the answer. He is the solution. He is the way maker. He is the healer. He is the son of God. Let's follow him. We should study prophecy because it reveals the power and the wisdom of God to absolutely control the future. Consider the birth of the nation of Israel. Every major prophet in the Old Testament prophesied that God would bring the Jewish people out of their Gentile graves. All of them said, Israel will, will, will be reborn. Israel is God's prophetic clock. When the Jewish people are in Israel, the clock is running. When the Jewish people are out of Israel, the clock stops. When the Roman un army under Titus surrounded Jerusalem in 70 AD, he besieged the city, no food in. In about six months, about one million Jews died from starvation. This is the reason when Jesus was walking with his cross to Calvary, he looked at the Jewish mothers and said, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children because this was just a few decades later. After that starvation, Titus took 70,000 Jewish men to Rome where they rebuilt what we call the Roman Colosseum where gladiators fought for their lives and Christians were fed to lions. The prophetic clock stopped and did not start again until May the 14th, 1948, when the nation of Israel was reborn, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 66, 8, a nation shall be born in a day. And that nation was the nation of Israel. The prophecy of Hosea concerning the rebirth of Israel is shockingly accurate. Other prophets said it's going to happen, but Hosea said when it's going to happen. He writes to the Jewish people in Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2, these words. Come and let us return to the Lord. He's talking to Israel and the Jewish people. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us up. Listen. After two days, he will revive us. 
On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Now, most people just leap over that and just keep going. But the Bible timeline is this. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Get that principle in your mind. On day one, that would be from year one to year 1,000, God disciplined the people of Israel. Hosea said, he has, storm, he has torn us. Say that with me. He has torn us. Brother, I won't tell you that's an understatement. In the year 800, the Roman Catholic Church started putting together the Crusades. There were eight in number. 100,000 crusaders answered the call of the Pope to go to Jerusalem and to deliver Jerusalem from the infidels. That would be the Jewish people. The Pope forgave them of their sins before they left. But they murdered and raped and robbed Jews from, from Europe to Jerusalem. When they got to Jerusalem on that first crusade, they gathered 969 Jewish women, men, and children and put them in the synagogue. They set the synagogue on fire. And while that synagogue was burning and the women and children were screaming for mercy, the crusaders were marching around that synagogue singing, Christ, we adore thee. And then going back home, they robbed, they raped, and they mangled the Jewish people. They had eight of those. God truly tore them. On day two, two, Hosea said, he will revive us. Day two goes from year 1001, 1200, 1300, 1400, 15, 1600, 17, 18, 1900, 1948. In the afternoon of the second day, Israel was reborn. In 1948, late in the afternoon of the second day, Ben-Gurion announced to the world that Israel was almost after 2,000 years born again. 11 minutes later, Harry Truman recognized the fact that America would embrace Israel. Why was that important? Because Israel was hated by Russia and it was told to our president, if you embrace Israel, we will be in a war with Russia in nothing flat. Harry Truman had a grandmother who was a Zionist. That grandmother read the Bible to Harry Truman. And when Harry Truman became president, because mysteriously Roosevelt died at appropriately the right time, Harry made that decision and the nation of Israel was reborn again by the sovereign will of God. Now here comes the top of this. On the third day, we will live in his sight. The third day began midnight in the year 2000. We right now are 23 years into the third day. And he says, Hosea says, we are going to see Jesus face to face in the third day. Now, before the Jews see him face to face, we will have been raptured seven years before that. We will have, we will have been gone to Israel. The point, we could experience the rapture of Jesus Christ before I finish preaching this sermon. There is nothing that needs to be fulfilled before we are in the presence of God in the new Jerusalem. Give the Lord a shout of praise. The rebirth of Israel is the greatest miracle in the Bible since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was listening to the radio with my father. I'm 83, pushing 84. It doesn't seem possible, but here I am. I was listening to the radio with my father, the radio young people, because television hadn't been born yet. When the United Nations made the announcement that Israel was recognized as a state, my mother, who was a great Bible scholar, who went to seminary, taught homiletics and hermeneutics. 
She heard this and she made this statement. This is the greatest day in prophecy since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ can return to earth. Never underestimate the love of God for the Jewish people. Never. Listen to David's prayer in 1 Chronicles 17, 20. O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on the earth, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people. The one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself, not America, Israel. Deuteronomy 7 and 6, for you, Israel and the Jewish people, are a holy people to the Lord your God, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. That's in the word of God. Not America, Israel. Don't ever underestimate God's love for Israel and the Jewish people. The first sign of Christ's return to earth was, shock, was the shocking and amazing rebirth of the state of Israel. The rebirth of Israel was the death of replacement theology. So that I know where I'm at on this. How many of you do not know what replacement theology is? Raise your hand. That's enough. Replacement theology was the doctrine of Pentecostals before 1948. And that doctrine went like this. God has cast the Jews aside. Look at all the horror that they have experienced. God no longer loves them. We, the church, have replaced Israel in the economy of God. That was a self-serving, selfish, idiotic, biblical interpretation by people of limited intellectual capacity. The rebirth of Israel was the death of replacement theology. When this happened, Israel was reborn. My father said, the Lord can come at any time. And my mother was listening. He said, yes, but it's not the third day. And when the third day came, she said, now, at any moment, the Son of God could stand in the clouds of heaven and snatch us off this earth. Israel has just celebrated its 75th year of independence. In these 75 years, the state of Israel with a land, land space that's smaller than New Jersey has become the epicenter of the earth. The Bible fact is that God blesses the Jewish people directly and he blesses the Gentiles through the Jewish people. Now get that in your mind. Why? Because God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will bless the nations of the world through you. He blesses the Gentiles through the Jewish people. How? The Jewish people gave us the Bible, every word of it written by the Jewish people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were all Jews. Prophets, all Jews, not a Baptist or Pentecostal in the bunch. The first family of Christianity, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, all Jews. Jesus loved the Jewish people. He still loves the Jewish people. The disciples were Jews. St. Paul was the Jews. God has challenged the church. I will bless those who bless you. Paul challenges the church in Galatians. If you have benefited from their spiritual things, then minister to them in material things because we are indebted to them for what they have given to us. Can I hear an amen? Washington, hello, Washington, D.C. God is watching your abuse of Israel. He is watching your abuse of Israel in this nuclear bomb matter with Iran. The day America stops blessing Israel will be the day that God stops blessing the United States of America. We have just given $6 billion. We didn't. Joe Biden has just given $6 billion to Iran. That's not blessing Israel. Iran is run by radical, radical people. 
who have sworn to kill every Jew that lives. Right now, Iran is building an air base. Right now, in Lebanon, which is the border of, of Israel, and they're talking about using that $6 billion that we just gave them to build that air attack that will be used to attack the nation of Israel. Iran is four hours away now by jet. When they have an airstrip in Lebanon, they won't any more than get that jet up until they be over Jerusalem. That's how critical this is. That's why Israel tonight is saying, we are on the verge of war in the Middle East. And when that war starts, ladies and gentlemen, it will never stop. It will never stop before the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. The second sign of Christ's coming is the sign of scoffers. Second Peter 3 says, knowing this, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers saying, where's the sign of his coming? Pastor Hagee, what difference does it make whether I believe in the rapture or not? Exactly this. Hebrews 9, 28 says, to those that eagerly look for him, will he appear the second time? If you're not eagerly looking for him, you're not going with him. The Bible says, watch and pray that you be counted worthy to escape those things that are coming on the earth. What things? This means the coming Antichrist who will kill every person on earth who refuses to take his mark. If you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, you will be left behind. Your options are going through the living hell of the great tribulation that lasts seven years with 21 global tragedies that I'll show you in a minute that will kill one third of the earth's population in just one day. The Antichrist will force you to take his mark in your right hand or your forehead. You refuse and he's going to cut your head off. You will be resurrected at the second coming. The second coming. And God will send you to the judgment of eternal hell in the judgment of the nations. Where's the sign of his coming? Scoffer, the fact that you're belittling Jesus Christ coming back is living proof that he's on the verge of stepping off that cloud, blowing the horn and saying, I'm here. The trump of God will sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise. If you listen closely, you can hear the footsteps of Messiah in the clouds of glory coming to rapture the church. We're not long for this world. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The third sign is the knowledge explosion. Daniel 12, 4 says, who wrote this 2,400 years ago, but you, Daniel, shut up the words of the book of Daniel and seal the book until the time of the end. Now listen to this. There are people who say, is this the last days? Ladies and gentlemen, the last days started when Jesus rose from the grave. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. I'm talking about the time of the end. And when the Bible says the time of the end, that means the end of the last days. There's a difference to there. Many will run to and fro and knowledge shall be greatly increased. The invention of the automobile is in the Bible. Did you know that? It has dramatically manifested the increase of knowledge that has changed the world at the time of the end. Listen to the prophet Nahum in chapter two, verse three and four, declare that the invention of the automobile, remember that this prophet rode a camel or a donkey at the ridiculous speed of about three miles an hour. There were no traffic jams. It took you forever to get anywhere, but then they had forever. The prophet writes, the chariots that would be cars shall be with flaming torches, listen to this word, in the day of the Lord's coming. In the day of the Lord's coming. The chariots shall rage in the streets. Think about cars at the rush hour. They should jostle one against the other in the broad way. 
Mm. They shall seem like torches that would be headlights, and they shall run like lightning. When you've only seen something go three miles an hour and see something going 70 miles an hour, it looks like lightning. That's a perfect description of the automobile. The most important phrase in this verse is the fact that this happens in the day of his coming meaning in the day when the Lord was preparing to return for his church. The invention of the airplane is in the Bible. The Wright brothers made their first flight December the 3rd, 1903. Today we have jet aircraft that can fly 600 miles with hundreds, an hour with hundreds of people going thousands of miles. That men would fly someday is foreseen in the prophetic scripture. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 31, 5, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem, and in defending he will deliver it, and listen, and passing over it he will preserve it. Now my grandfather did not understand that verse of scripture. He thought Isaiah was having a woo-woo dream. The verse was a mystery until 1917 when the British under General Allenby came up from Egypt to defend Jerusalem. Allenby was a devoted Christian. He asked God to show him how he could deliver Jerusalem from the Turks without damaging the holy city. The next day he sent his scouting planes flying at low altitudes over the city of Jerusalem. Most Turks had never seen a plane. They were terrified, and in terror, they ran out of Jerusalem without firing a shot. Thus, in a literal way, did the Lord God of Israel deliver Jerusalem with birds flying as the airplane passing over it. Our God is an awesome God. He's telling us what's going to happen. He's telling us how it's going to happen. And he's screaming from the balconies of heaven, get ready, get ready, get ready. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. From the Garden of Eden until 1900, knowledge was the same. Some people believe that the medical practices of Egypt surpassed our practice in the 1900s. Transportation was the same. Men rode horses, as did King David. Communication was the same. Agriculture was the same. Medical knowledge was the same. My father's generation went from the horse and buggy to the jet age, from dying with the flu in 1917, which my grandparents, who were ministers, had 10 sons, four of them died in the flu epidemic of 1917. Nothing to stop it. It was, it was caused from soldiers who came back from Europe and they had that flu. And it went through this country taking thousands of lives. The knowledge of medical science is so staggering now, we've had to redefine death. Communication has gone from talking over the fence to picking up your cell phone and talking to someone on the other side of the world. If you have a little gray hair, you can remember the day when you went to a phone that was on the wall, you cranked it, called your ap operator. Your operator would call the first major city where the person you lived or used to live was there. They called their operator and that operator called the person you were looking for. That person called that operator who called the middle operator who called your operator and said, now you can talk. And that was 30 minutes later. <laughs> I've seen that with my own eyes. Now you can pick up one of these wretched cell phones and may not live to see the day where they don't exist because every person you pass is a walking photographer and they only want to take three photos from three different directions. One is plenty. <laughs> Knowledge has exploded. We are that generation that is going to see the coming of Jesus in the clouds of glory for the church victorious. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Give him praise in this house. Let me make this statement. 
Knowledge without God only produces an intellectual barbarian. Knowledge without God only produces an intellectual barbarian. I have three university degrees and I can say that. We are that generation that's ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. We are that generation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not trying to be, I am the way, the only way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I have the solution for those who are living in the hell created by your godless choices. It's to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord because Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. The word of God has the truth. Let us walk in that truth. Give the Lord praise in this house. The God we serve is hope for the hopeless. Try him, love him, serve him, never fail him. Christ is still the answer for you, for your family, for America, for the world. Hallelujah for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord praise in this house. The fourth sign of Christ's coming is preaching the gospel around the world. I call it global evangelism. In Matthew 24, Jesus presented the spine of prophecy with his 12 disciples on the Mount of Olives for their final meeting together prior to his crucifixion. Matthew 24 has nothing to do with the church. It's a rabbi talking to his disciples about the future of the Jews from that moment until the end of time. The Bible records, now as he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately asking three questions. Tell us when shall these things be? Two, what will be the sign of your coming? Three, what is the sign of the end of the age? Jesus answered Matthew 24, 14 with these shocking words. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come, and then the end will come. A few weeks ago, Pastor Matt was sitting with me on the stage platform at Cornerstone Church. We have that little conversation between the singing of the choir and the taking the offering. And Matt is telling us how many nations are watching and how many cities are watching because we have the electronics to tell you about how many people are watching at even any given minute. And he said, Dad, we have 100 nations watching our national telecast right now. 100 nations watching our telecast right now. He said, every nation in the world is watching. The Bible says, when the gospel is preached to all the world, then shall the end come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray up, pack up, look up. We're going up in the twinkling of an eye. Give the Lord praise in the house. Bless his holy name. The fifth prophetic event that will shake the nations of planet Earth is the rapture of the church. If Christ is coming, and it's imminent, why now? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of victory, and the voice of an archangel with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds of glory to meet the Lord in the air. Some say, Pastor, that's never happened. That's absolutely wrong. Yes, it has happened. Elijah was taken into heaven on chariots of fire. He's been there for 3,000 years. He's coming back to Jewish people in the tribulation to tell them the Messiah is coming. That's validated in Malachi 4, 5. Enoch was taken into heaven. He's coming back with Elijah. Jesus on the resurrection morning rose from the grave and he ascended to the throne of God. Acts 1, 11. The angel said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus 
This same Jesus shall come in like manner, literally, physically, visibly, as you have seen him gone. You put these verses together, and this is what's going to happen. Very soon, at any moment, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Glory, suddenly appears in heaven, brilliant as the noonday sun shining, as lightning flashing from the east to the west. The trump of God shall sound, announcing the appearance of royalty. For he is the Prince of Glory. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. The champion of Calvary who has defeated death, hell and the grave. The voice of the archangel shall summon the righteous dead from their graves. All over the earth, the bodies of resurrected saints will rise to meet the Lord in the air. Cars will be empty by the freeways. Their motors are rutting. The drivers and occupants have been strangely taken and are missing. Homes of believers will have the dishes on the table. The food is on the stove, but the occupants have gone to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. (laughs) Hallelujah. Headlines will be screaming. Millions are mission. The Christians have disappeared from the earth. There's going to be an instant economic crash. Why? Because we're the only one paying taxes. The tax base of these spendthrift socialists will be saying, bye, bye. Now it's yours. And that's when the Antichrist is going to show up and put the one world currency in place. I'll get to that in a minute. If you're not saved, don't dare fly with a Christian pilot. He's going up and you're going down. This church, this one, is going to be filled with weeping people, sobbing hysterically, screaming, the Lord has come. And we've been left behind to go through the hell of the Antichrist and the great tribulation. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't know Jesus, I'm talking to you. Hello, America. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, or the coming Antichrist, the chief son of Satan, the Lord of all scoffers. You will either be a servant of Jesus Christ or a slave to Satan. Every person in this room is one of those things. Today is your day of decision. The sixth sign of coming is the king of the north, that's Russia. About 2,500 years ago, Ezekiel predicted that Russia would return to power in the latter days to lead a 10 nation invasion of Israel. As we speak, Russia and Iran are united and Iran will soon have a nuclear weapon to attack Israel, and they promise to use it. As we speak, Iran right now is building that air strip on the border of Israel, sponsored by the United States taxpayers. Ezekiel 38 records this word. And you shall come from your place out of the north parts, and many people with you, all of them with a great company and a mighty army, who shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land in the last days. Latter days are right now. The prophet Daniel testifies the ruler who would lead the attack against Israel in the latter days as being the king of the north, Daniel 11, 15 through 35. Ezekiel prophesied that the invading armies would come to Israel, quote, from the far north. Now, Ezekiel nailed it. Ezekiel 38, 6 and 14, from the far north. The only nation in the far north from Israel is Russia. According to Ezekiel, Russia will lead these following nations, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Germany, and several Islamic nations will come into this invasion of Israel. Why will Russia lead this invasion? Ezekiel 38, 4, God says, I will put a hook in your jaw and compel you to come to Israel. A hook in your jaw is a compelling force. This information was given to me by military personnel in Israel who are in a position to know. Is Russia's first hook, listen, 
They have to gain a warm water port for its navy because Russia's navy is frozen in place for four months out of every year. And if they are going to be a global military power, their navy has to have access to the seven seas 24-7 every day the sun rises. That's why Russia has to have that warm water port to reach the nations of the earth. This is not my opinion. This came to me from military people who know nothing about the word of God. Israel was the only warm water port on that side of the globe. Israel and Russia have already signed that contract for 50 years. Russia's second hook in the jaw is this. Russia will invade Israel because several years ago, Israel discovered a huge treasure trove of oil that according to the Wall Street Journal has the potential to supply an abundance of oil for Israel, for every vehicle they have, for every plane they have, for everything they have that moves, that uses fuel. They have enough fuel for the next hundred years. Russia knows that. Russia is running out of oil. They have to have an oil, uh, an oil base, energy base, to be effective as a nation that has an army. Russia can control Europe and have unlimited access to fulfill all of their military ambitions to become a global, global superpower. Ezekiel's prophecy in chapters 38, 39, given over 2,500 years ago, is happening right now before our eyes. Iran and Russia are hooked at the hip. Iran has given Russia 1,700 rockets in the past few days. World War III has already started. People do not want to recognize that. They don't want to admit that. But it has. Remember that World War II was going two years before America got in. Before the Japanese bombed us at Pearl Harbor, that war had been going for two years. That war has started when Russia invaded the, the nation next, right next to them. Listen to the church is raptured before the Antichrist makes his appearance in Europe as the leader of the New World Order. The New World Order will establish a one world currency. We're moving toward that right now. The bankers in my church, I asked them, how long would it take for us to convert to a one world currency with the technology we have? All of them answered, over the weekend, I said, no, you've got to be kidding. No, no. He said, technologically, we could do it over the weekend. A one world currency, a one world religion. I believe it will be the Muslim faith. The church is gone. The Holy Spirit is gone. The guy on the gray horse is beheading everyone that doesn't take the mark. The Muslims cut your head off when you disagree with them. Establish a one world government under the Antichrist. This module began with the United Nations. There are people who are talking about America yielding its sovereignty to the United Nations. Let me tell you something, that's the conversation of empty headed fools. What will crush the Russian Iran invasion of Israel? Israel's secret weapon is going to show up, God Almighty. God Almighty. God Almighty. The Bible says, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. According to Ezekiel, God Almighty will use an earthquake. Get this picture. Israel is being invaded by Iran, by Russia, by all of the nations that I have just mentioned. And God is going to use an earthquake first to wipe out a significant percentage of them. You say, oh, God would never do that. God's already done that. You remember when people back talked Moses about his right to lead him? God just opened up the ground, swallowed them. Moses is my leader. Anybody else want to complain? He's already done that. It will be done by friendly fire in the chaos of this earthquake. 
You will have nine armies there speaking nine languages, and they'll start shooting at each other. Oh, God would not do that. He's already done that in the Old Testament. Read it. Where the enemies of Israel were so many, and the prophet of God sounded the trumpet and broke the pictures, and they started fighting each other while Israel just watched them kill each other. Then God is going to give his signature. He's going to send massive hailstones that weigh almost 100 pounds, and he's going to kill that Russian invasion. He is going to kill 84% of that invasion force. That's five out of six. Oh, God would not do that. If you read the story of Joshua, when they're fighting for Israel's survival, he's calling for the sun to stand still, and there's just one verse down there at verse 19 that says, and more were killed by the stones that God sent from heaven than the swords of Israel. Oh, God's just warming up his pitching arm right now. King James 39, verse 2. King James nails it. Other translations are, are weak. King James 39, 2 says, I, God, am going to leave a sixth part of you. This is Russia's coming in. If he leaves a sixth part, that means five out of six got killed. Five out of six is 84%. That's how that all works out. God's in heaven saying, come on, sucker. Come on. I've seen your programs to that you persecuted the Jewish people. Come down here. I'm going to clean your clock and laugh while I do it. You said, God, don't think that way. I think he does. I would. Iran is days away from having a nuclear weapon. I think they will have the nuclear weapon before they tell anybody because they know Israel would be all over them instantly. Iran has intercontinental missiles right now with a nuclear warhead, which they don't have. With a nuclear warhead, they could wipe out New York with one shot. Recently, listen to this, China shot a rocket that went around the world without detention, and it returned to China and hit the mark that it was supposed to hit. Get this, it was launched from China and went around the world at a speed five times the speed of sound. So fast it could not be tracked and it came back and hit the target. Our military didn't know it until they read it in the newspaper. In the World Wall Street Journal this week, they are confirming that now this is going to be given to North Korea and China is going to simultaneously have it. And they confess that America has no answer to it and we have nothing that can match that. China's message to America, we have the ability to launch missiles from China or Cuba. Think about that. How many of you were alive when Jack Kennedy was president? You remember when the Russians thought they were gonna put missiles in Cuba? He shut that down just like that. But there, China is now in Cuba putting up missile sites and you're not even reading about it in the paper. It's not even on television. We're not about to go to war over that, but it's happening. It's happening. We have built the ability to launch missiles from China or Cuba with nuclear warheads that can hit missile sites on our military bases. Thanks to that seven day spy balloon that they sent over America, data was recorded and is there for their use. Hello America, World War III has started. China intends to take us down. Washington wake up. When it looks like there is no hope, the God of all hope is going to show up. When it looks like peace is impossible, the Prince of Peace is looking for a place 
for to bury your enemies. Our God is greater than the greatest. He is wiser than the wisest. He is higher than the highest. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power the minds of men cannot comprehend. When you watch the evening news and it looks like America and the world are going to hell in a handcart, that may be true. But the church of Jesus Christ is going to heaven in the twinkling of an eye. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Give the Lord praise in the house. The seventh sign that the Lord is coming is the king of the east, China. 40 years ago when I taught that China would become a superpower in the future, people laughed. They're not laughing now. China is a military superpower and they intend to take America down. Why are they sending spy craft over America for seven days if they're not? China now knows every nuclear silo and where it's located. Chinese agents have invaded America and they're coming across our unprotected southern borders. That unprotected southern borders has produced more poison to the United States of America than anything that's ever happened in our history. That is single-handedly destroying this nation. There's only one way to stop it and that's for you and every person you know in this next election to put somebody in the White House that will support America and support the American people. In a way, don't blame China. They're communists. Their ideas take over. Blame the Biden administration for this corrupt betrayal of America and the, and the, and the American people. Recently, the Wall Street Journal carried the story of a two-star general in the U.S. military who was commissioned by Washington to make a study comparing America's military ability and China's military ability. After a two-year study, the decision was clear. If America engaged China in a military conflict, America would, without doubt, lose. China's attack on America has already started. The COVID crisis was created by China. Don't you ever forget that. It was sent to America that killed one million of our people. That's something America needs to say and say again until people start knowing it. Fentanyl drugs have killed 100,000 young Americans provided by China, sent to, sent to Mexico as the cartels have brought it across the southern border. China not only has military information, they have purchased or controlled approximately 400,000 acres of America's farmland. They can affect how much food we eat right now. They can control food production in America. Everyone who eats should be concerned. And from this point of view, some of you should be seriously concerned. <laughs> the Bible presents the king of the East who will send a marching army of 200 million people in the future to the Battle of Armageddon. This is going to be the mother of all wars. That army of 200 million will march up the Euphrates River. This is recorded in Revelation, which scientists say is now drying up. Look it up on your phone. Euphrates River, it's drying up. Why? Because if Jesus comes tonight, several years down the road, the Chinese army and all that come with them to Israel for the battle of Armageddon are going to come up the dry riverbed of the Euphrates River. Think about this. The Euphrates River is recorded in Genesis 2 as one of the four rivers that God created that have been ever flowing and have never dried up. Now it's drying up and they don't have a clue as to why. God's in heaven just turning down the knobs. The eighth sign of his coming is nuclear warfare. This is the end of the prophecy message. I want to go through this chart and about to, when is this service over? <laughs> Say what? Just whenever I get done. Oh, that's good. I'm 
so used to I'm so used to preaching on television. He preached. <laughs> you shut off and leave. The eighth sign of the coming is nuclear warfare. Before the birth of nuclear warfare, there was a body of prophetic scripture that was an absolute mystery. Now they're tragically clear as we race toward Armageddon. Zechariah 14, 12, and this is the plague that Lord, the, the Lord will send on all who come to fight against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall be consumed in their sockets, and their tongues shall melt in their mouths. That's in the Bible. Zechariah 14, the most powerful H-bomb we have can produce 150 million degrees Fahrenheit in one millionth of a second. That's how your tongue can be consumed in your mouth before your body can hit the ground. For years, only America and Russia had nuclear weapons. We felt secure because we had something called mutually assured destruction but not so today. Today, nine countries have nuclear power with roughly 12,500 warheads right now. World War III has started. Never in the history of military warfare has a weapon been invented that has not been used. People say we will never see nuclear warfare. That's wrong. I believe it will happen after the church is gone, but I assure you, this world is going to experience the fruit that it has produced. When Jerusalem was reunited with the state of Israel in the Six Day War, we were officially ready for the rapture. That was 1967. Luke 21, 24 says, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles, that's us, be fulfilled. Until our time ends. Psalms 102, 16, when the Lord shall build up Zion, that's Jerusalem, he shall appear in his glory. Yes. Zephaniah 3, 16, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not, for the Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. He is mighty and he will rejoice over you with joy. Why the war over the city of Jerusalem? Because it's a supernatural battleground. Satan wants Jerusalem for his Messiah. The Antichrist, the chief son of Satan, God has promised that King David, that his seed, Jesus Christ, would reign forever from the holy city of Jerusalem. The Bible calls Jerusalem the city of God. The Lord says, I will yet again choose Jerusalem. I have placed my name there. Jerusalem is the epicenter of the universe. Jerusalem is the shoreline of eternity. Jerusalem was King David's passion. If I forget the old Jerusalem, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth and my right hand forget its cunning. Jerusalem is where Isaiah and Jeremiah penned the principles of righteousness that became the moral foundation of Western civilization. Jerusalem is the key to the future. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. Give the Lord praise in the house of God. <laughs> Jerusalem is where Jesus Christ will return. He's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives and he's going to establish this kingdom on earth that will last for a thousand years. Glory to God. Why? Because knowledge without God only produces an intellectual barbarian. Listen to that. Knowledge without God only produces an intellectual barbarian. We are in that generation that's ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus can turn your sorrow into joy. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus that we serve, he is El Shaddai, the bread of life, the living water. He is the strength to the weary. He's higher than the highest. He's wiser than the wisest. He's greater than the greatest. He's stronger than the strongest. The strength to the weary he gives. He gives light to those that walk in darkness. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is forever the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Give him praise in the house. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God.
I'm going to go through this in about 10 minutes. It's steroids. We are right here. This is the Laodicean church. It's the lukewarm church. And that certainly describes the church in America. I'm going to cheat. The lukewarm church is the church that replaces ritual for righteousness. The lukewarm church is the church that refuses to recognize the truth and the power of the word of Jesus Christ. The lukewarm church is the church that has made up its own basis of forgiveness. The lukewarm church is now saying, you know, it doesn't make any difference what you do. You can just keep on sinning and God will love you anyway. No. Grace gives you the chance to forgive. Grace gives you the chance to repent. The Bible says that whosoever confesses and forsakes his sin shall have mercy with the Lord. You have to confess and forsake your sin. Then you have mercy with the Lord. Please hear that because we are now living in a dispensation where the church has become so loose in what it means to know the Lord that they live a life that would embarrass a sinner and come to church on Sunday morning and say, I'm a child of God. Until you follow Jesus Christ in the beauty of holiness, my friend, you don't know Jesus Christ. Let me go. Now, the next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. The rapture brings you to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to answer right here. You're going to answer for every word, every thought, and every deed. Right here, you're going to receive one of five crowns. You can look at someone's crown and tell what they did and how well they did. Your crown will be like a military insignia. You see a military man, you know his rank, you know where he's been, you know what he's done. Your crown in heaven is going to be exactly that. You're also right there going to receive the robe of righteousness. You'll be able, your, the Bible says your robe consists of the righteous acts of the saints. If there is no righteous acts in your life, you better get with it. Or you'll be weeping, wearing a paper bag when you get to heaven. Not that bad, but not good. Then we come to the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven personages. And roll it up so I can see the Antichrist down here. There he is. For those of you who missed the rapture, this is your guy, the Antichrist. He's going to find you. He's going to give you the opportunity to sign up with his new world order. If you don't sign, take his stamp in your right hand or forehead, he's going to cut your head off. You'll go from right here to right there. If you can roll that down just a little bit. Souls that are under the altar. You'll stay there for seven years until the end when Christ comes back as the second coming and he sets up the new Jerusalem. Go back to where we were. I'm going to give you a workout here. There you are. Now, so these guys are troublemakers. There are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven personages. The Bible is a book of sevens. This is going to be the middle of the week. This is called the tribulation. From here over is called the great tribulation. Why? The first three and a half years is the tribulation because the trials are not nearly as bad as the last half. The last half is going to be literal hell on earth. If you can slide it down just a little bit so they can see that. Roll that up so that uh, we can see what this is right here. There you are. In this the great tribulation. Every person that's living on the earth is going to break out from head to feet with boils. The sea is going to turn to blood. The rivers are going to turn to blood. These are the same judgments that God sent to Israel, uh, sent to Egypt. There will be great heat. Hello, King Charles. That climate change you've been looking for, here it is, baby, right here, right there. 
It's going to get so hot that the rich and the powerful crawl into the caves and beg God to let them die. And God says, not a chance, not a chance. And then is darkness that will cause global depression. The Euphrates is completely dried up. Isn't that an amazing thing? Because it's getting ready for the Battle of Armageddon. And right now, the Chinese army is looking at that river as to be their highway to this battle. Then there are going to be three unclean spirits. These are demon spirits. And these demon spirits are going into the world and calling all the nations of the world to come together for one great battle. And that battle is the battle of Armageddon. Where am I? There he is right there. The king of the east will come from this direction. The antichrist will bring the armies of the west from this direction. You've got 200 million people here and a bunch of people here. This is the mother of all wars. What happens at this exact moment? I'll say this because I can see you're getting tired. There, at this exact moment, Jesus Christ is coming from heaven. My, red, my, my green mark is it. No, 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 don't, don't, don't get away with it. Just let me do it. Yeah, there it is. Jesus Christ is coming from heaven and he is coming with you and I, the church triumphant. We've been there seven years. We've been in heaven for seven years. We're wearing our white robes. We're mounted on white horses. I love that picture. I love that picture. Brother, you talk about fun. This is going to be fun. And Jesus Christ comes and he sees this huge battle where these people are fighting for global supremacy and who want to take and hold Jerusalem. And he, Jesus Christ, destroys all of this army. The Bible says that he has the blood on his garments. He is going to annihilate them. How many of them? All of them. He is going to kill all of them. I love this story right here. Payday someday, baby, here it is, right there. Then Jesus Christ will put his foot on the Mount of Olives and for 1,000 Satan will be bound and thrown into hell with a lot of other people who didn't receive Jesus. We'll have 1,000 years of perfect peace, 1,000 years where there is no more war, 1,000 years where there is no more sickness, 1,000 years where there is no more hospitals, no more corrupt politicians, no more abortions, no more sex, sex trafficking, no more child abuse, no more racial conflict, no more worry, no more depression, no more tears, no more suffering. There is the land of perfect peace and it's going to be right there in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. The lion shall lay down with the lamb. Hallelujah to the lamb of God. At the end of 1,000 years, Satan is going to be released and he's going to make a battle stand for Jerusalem. God is going to wipe him out. Can you believe this? that after people have lived a thousand years of perfect peace, no one has ever been sick, everything has gone well for a thousand years, the devil is released from hell and he gets, he gets a huge number of people to go with him. That's just mind boggling, but it's gonna happen. God's gonna wipe them out right there. Back to the lake of fire you go. The judgment of the wicked, the great white throne judgment why is it that men are weeping and wailing in the great white throne judgment? Because they know that they're coming just to be sentenced. There is no mercy here. They're going from the judgment bar of God into the lake of fire forever. Right there, up, right there's the escalator down. There's your room. Then there's the new heaven, the new earth, and the new city of Jerusalem, the world has come to an end and we live forever and forever and forever and forever in perfect peace, 
Stand and give the Lord a shout of praise in this place. The King of glory is coming. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Give the Lord praise. 